I went through my emails yesterday and I found the original email requesting uh, from uh, Nipsey and Rock Nation um, requesting to me to set up a meeting with the chief and uh, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, this was dated February <coughs> February 26th. Our goal is to work with the department to help improve communication, relationships, and work towards changing the culture and dialogue between LAPD and the inner city. We want to hear about your new programs and your goals for the department, as well as how we can help stop gang violence and help you help kids. So it uh, takes time to set up meetings. We did. It was set up for um, yesterday. And the chief called me on Sunday and uh, told me, this was 15 minutes after, that uh, that Nipsey Hussle had been uh, assassinated, been murdered. Hello family, this is African Escort and I'm here with a new video. So, two weeks ago today, we lost the amazing rapper, activist, entrepreneur, revolutionary, so many things, Nipsey Hussle. And the world has been really mourning, um, especially people in hip hop, especially um, the Los Angeles community, everyone has really been in mourning because it just doesn't make sense when you have someone die who was doing good for people and was just not selfish and honestly wanted the world to be better. And that's, you know, what always hits you worse is like, it's one thing we have, you know, people who are looking out for themselves and just basically not doing anything to change the world for anyone else. But when you have someone who was actually looking out for other people and trying to do good by other people and they're taken out it's just so crazy and disturbing so that was two weeks ago what we have now is there's been some developments about some things with the LAPD and I thought they were important things to talk about because a lot of people I noticed when Nipsey died they rushed to judgment as far as the LAPD, because some of them really did express remorse for his death. Some of them were really sad about his death. And um, a lot of people said, wow, you know, even the LAPD, they loved him and everything. And I think um, a lot of people are so quick to forgive the power structures and forget things that have happened before. We're so quick, you know, oh my goodness, you're expressing remorse for this rapper, but we're going to forget you know, the allegations, for example, that uh, the LAPD had something to do with Biggie's murder. We're going to forget that. We're going to forget the um, fact that the LAPD beat Rodney King to a pulp. We're going to forget the well-documented history with the LAPD. As with every police department, you can find a well-documented history where there's a significant black population of just overall racism, white supremacy, um, and oppression. So... People are really quick to forget. People, are, I've noticed, are very quick to want these power structures to be for the people and to believe that they are. And this is something I've noticed with, with our people particularly. We're very quick where we see people and institutions that we know have historically done us wrong try to um, show that they want to do us well. We're quick to just say, oh, let's move on and let's keep going. Now, 
forgiveness is great, you know, but you have to have it in perspective. And um, the thing that recently came out, there was two things that I thought were very disturbing. So there was a recording that came out. Now, I understand that the police, the LAPD have denied that this is actually them um, on the recording, but um, it is believed. And um, it, it's believed that this, this the, the, there was a call that was intercepted or the walkie-talkie system um, of the LAPD was intercepted by someone. And basically, during the funeral of Nipsey Hussle, you hear these same, the same LAPD officers who just a week or so ago, people were saying, oh, you know, they love him too. They love the, uh, Nipsey too. Um, saying that his mother looked like a man, saying that his father looked like a woman, and saying that um, basically something like, uh, he, I bet he stinks, um, you know, and they should put him in the ground, you know, they should have put him in the ground a week ago so he could stink less, something something of that nature, something disparaging about someone who just passed away. And this, this is the same, you know, individuals allegedly from the same police department. Now, uh, uh, in addition to that, there was also a report that was released and this one, I, it upset me so much. So if you don't know the whole story with what happened with Nipsey, supposedly he had went to his store that day, the day that he was killed, he went to a store to buy, um, to give his friend some clothes. So his friend just got out of prison and he wanted to give him some clothes to go to a family reunion. And the friend's name was Carrie Lathan. Now, the man, when, while he's trying to hook, the, hook his guy up, this dude basically comes in, comes in and kills him. And we're not going to go into, you know, what, what the guy was doing there and why he killed him. But, you know, we just know that he ended up dead. The LAPD, after the, after the death of Nipsey, after expressing how much they love him, um, basically arrested this guy who was shot by the assassin of Nipsey Hussle. And the reason they arrested him is because this man was in the presence of a known gang member. And this is the, the, the no gang member is Nipsey Hussle. So let's read an article. This is TMZ, um, who always has the quickest news when it comes to these things. One of the victims shot in the Nipsey Hussle murder has been arrested for associating with Nipsey. Sources with knowledge tell TMZ that Carrie Lathan, a 56-year-old man who was shot in the back outside of Nipsey's Marathon clothing store, was taken to the hospital a week ago and treated and released. Five days after the shooting, Lathan, who was out on parole after serving 20 years for murder, was arrested at his halfway house for associating with a gang member, namely Nipsey. One of the standard conditions of parole is not associating with known gang members, and police claim that Nipsey was a member of the Rolling Sixties Crips. Lathan is now in Men's Central Jail in Los Angeles, where he awaits as authorities try to revoke his parole. Lathan is in a wheelchair, the result of the shooting, and unable to walk. So this is just shows you what the system is built for. I mean, first of all, the idea that you, can, you can't be in the presence of a known gang member when the, the whole Los Angeles like is riddled with gang members. So you basically have to no longer be around some people who you might be friends with, some people who might be your family, might be your close family. Um, it's, it, to me, it's just another way for the police department to try to divide the black community because now you have these people they're on parole and they can't even associate with any of you so this man you have to understand it's probably this these past two weeks have been hell for him i, I actually thought about him a lot when i learned that that's why nipsey was at the store because you have to understand the guilt that you have to feel even though he had nothing to do with nipsey's murder even though it wasn't him you know even though he could never have seen this coming could never have predicted that this guy was going to kill him you know he, nipsey was doing him a favor that day he was going to give him some clothes so this man has to live with the rest of his life that damn like he was coming out there for me what if I, you know, didn't didn't hit him up? What if I waited a couple of days? What if, what if, you know, if things were different? He's probably asking himself a lot of what ifs. He probably feels all the guilt, and even though again, it's not his fault at all. But just being a human being, I know for me, I would be thinking, wow, like he was. This is this is kind of just because of me. This happened because of me. Um, he left and quickly to come to the store to help him without his security because um, he's just in a rush to help a friend. So this man has been dealing with a lot these past two weeks. Um, he's not only dealing with the emotional trauma, he's dealing with physical trauma. As I stated, this man's in a wheelchair. He was shot. He was a victim of the same murder. And then on top of that, he's arrested.
because he went to see a friend who was going to give him a do him a favor, going to just give him some clothes. He's arrested and now faces his parole being revoked and going right back to prison. And this is the type of system that this is. This is the, how they work. And I love you like how they waited five days. Um, they always wait. I told you, I like they always wait before they do the jacked up stuff. They wait till our emotions are down because they try to get things done when we're not as antsy, when we're not as as uptight, um, when we're distracted by other things. You know, you notice that the police verdicts saying uh, releasing cops or whatnot for uh, murder. You notice that they, they they come like way after the initial protest for the murders. For example, um, Mike Brown, it came so so late after um, the, the recent ones that on Clark, the verdict came so late after Antoine Rose. All of these murder, murder verdicts, they come so late. And I honestly think a lot of it is intentional because I think that they try to sneak these things in whenever people are no longer thinking about them. They try to do it once everything has died down. And you have to remember, oh, yeah, that did happen. Oh, what? He got not guilty? How? But it wasn't the same you were feeling a year ago when it first happened. When you were, like, out on the streets protesting, calling for the police to step down. Like, there's a reason why that time passes. They try to sneak things in, you know? And this, to me, is another example of trying to sneak it in. They tried to wait a few days, let this man, you know. He got out. Well, he got out of the hospital, um... I believe a week after the shooting, um, and is it, uh, did I read that correct? Um, okay, so he's taken to the hospital. Yeah, he's taken to the hospital a week ago. He's treated and released, so he was released right there. And then five days later, they arrest him for this, and they then knew that you know he was don't, he was with him. Um, this is this is the reason I want to talk about this is because we have to not be so quick to look at an institution differently you can look at individuals differently because people do change you know not always um and you should always be cautious with how you judge someone of, of having changed but people do change um it happens all the time but institutions institutions are built for a particular purpose and as i stated in a previous video systems theory is you look at the results of the institution and based on the results you can always judge why it was built for the first in the first place. So we look at the results of the police department, uh, as far as police brutality, um, framing of people, uh, discrimination, um, disproportionate um, arrest of black people. Th this, these are the, these are the things that we get from the police department: policing our neighborhoods, having us live in a war zone. And when you have these results, what do you say? about why the reason the reason why it was built well based on the results based on how this what the system produces i could say that the system was made to just to uh to control black people i could say that the system was made to purposely arrest black people disproportionately i could say that the system was made to prove to brutalize black communities i could say that the system was made to police black neighborhoods so when we take stop looking at it as individuals and i understand not everyone who's a cop is a bad person i don't think that at all you know, I don't just say, oh, you're all pigs. Like, no, there are good people in the police department. The issue is when you are a good person and you join a bad institution, you can't change the reason the system was made. You can't change what the system produces. All you can do is, in your small capacity, you could try not to be as bad as the other ones. But the nature of police departments, especially with the blue wall of silence, you know, even though there's some cops who wouldn't do the same things, that a lot of these cops do. Um, a lot of these cops won't report them if they see them do it. Because if you report, if you're, excuse me, if you're in the system and you report one of these people, the fact is that you're going to basically be labeled. This is ironic. They basically label you like a snitch inside of the police department. So you know, police are always saying we have to stop uh, demonizing people for snitching when it comes to the streets. But when it comes to the police department, they don't you snitch because you will be labeled a snitch. We will treat you like a snitch. We will harass you. We will do all types of things to you. Your minds will quit being in the police department. And so if you're not willing to quit, if it gets to that, if you're not willing to step down, then you are going to be in a position to be compromised. You know, you're going to be compromised because it's always blue before black. And you're not going to have a career in the police department doing right by the black community um, unless you're willing 
to take that dive and be willing to quit and willing to no longer be in position. So all this to say, I remember when, um, during the Freddie Gray, riot, Freddie Gray riots, I was in Baltimore at the time when the riots were happening. I was in law school. And I remember um, what was happening was the there was riots basically um, in the neighborhoods, but it started spreading into downtown. And that's where the business is. That's where the money is. And when it started spreading into downtown near the businesses, the white owned businesses, that's when you've seen that the National Guard was activated. That's when you've seen the police department going haywire as far as trying to uh, kill the protests. And I came to the conclusion, these people were not here to protect and serve. I mean, I always knew that wasn't the case, but they're here to protect property. That's what they're here for. They're here to protect the common white person's way of life. They're here to uphold it and they're here to make sure that it's intact. And to do that, they basically make sure that us, the victims of white supremacy, that vic the victims of these people, that we don't get out of hand. That's what their job is. So understanding this, I knew from there and out, there's a particular reason why the police are the way that they are. So to try to change a police department that has been built that way, it takes more than just... Um, protests it takes more than trying to get laws passed you literally have to destroy the system and, and create something else and i don't see anyone calling for that so i only say that to say um i'm not surprised with the with the cops with these dirty moves if that was the recording uh, the the intercepted recording of the police um talking about nipsey hustle and his mother um and in addition arresting this man um carrie lathan um these things aren't surprising. You know, these the, the small good deeds and the small trinkles of people who might actually be in the police department actually have felt something about Nipsey Hussle being killed. They don't control what the system is made of. They don't certainly can't change the system. So what, what what's the point of looking at these people as being some type of movement or change in the system? That's not what it is. And I know it's unfortunate because obviously Nipsey, the next day after his death, he's supposed to meet with the police. And I think a lot of our people, we, we think that we can change things with the police. We can change dynamics with the police. But we, again, we have to always remember the system was created for a particular reason. And they're doing what they were created to do. And they're doing it well. So to assume that they would rather do something different because it's right, it's not always going to work out that way. So that's all I have on this. Um, I would love to see your thoughts. And again, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle. Uh, his funeral was very touching. And, you know, to me, all the rappers, the hip hop moguls, that's how you should want to go out. Like, you you should want to have some, such an impact on people that you remember like that. Because, you know, I, I was a baby when um, Pac and Biggie were killed or a toddler or something like that. Um, so I don't remember those. But... I, I'd imagine that I've like I've never seen any recordings or any like people talking about a funeral the way this one was, and that's how you should want to go out. That's how you should want to be celebrated, not just by um, people who love you because of your family, but by people who are touched by you, even people who don't know your music that were touched by you. That's something that's more significant to look at. So that's all I have for today. I will see you all in another video.